Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be doing an analysis and valuation of Match Group Inc. Now, if you don't know who Match Group is, they are essentially a conglomerate that owns a bunch of dating apps and websites. For example, they have Tinder, they have Hinge, and they have some older or more classic dating websites like Plenty of Fish and Match.com. So, even though you may not know Match Group, you probably have heard, at least, about some of their apps and websites. So, that pretty much explains the business. And honestly, what I'm going to do is just jump straight into the financials of Match Group because I find them very interesting and I think there's a lot to learn from them. So, Match Group, and this is from their latest letter to shareholders, is a growth company in terms of their revenue growth. And as you see, the revenue growth from 2018 all the way to 2022 has been growing 19%, 17%, 25%, and then from 2021 to 2022, 7%, right? And it breaks it down here, where clearly Tinder is their main cash cow, and then you have the Evergreen and Emerging Direct Revenue. Evergreen is that like Match.com, Plenty of Fish, and a few other emerging apps. Then you have Hinge, and you have the Asian Revenue, and some indirect revenue. You also have operating income, which, as you see, actually decreased significantly in this last year, 2022, although it had been increasing previously. And you have this adjusted operating income, which personally, I'm not a huge fan of, and I will explain why in a little bit. Now, as you see, match is growing, but with this decrease in revenue growth, and this decrease in operating income in 2022, it seems like they're going maybe through a little bit of growth pains. Now, this is the adjusted operating income. What they're doing here is they're grabbing the operating income that you can see here, which they're working back from the net earnings of the company, and they're adding stock-based compensation, depreciation, and amortization. Now, what's the problem I have with this? Depreciation and amortization are already counted in the cash from operations, so double counting it seems a little bit disingenuous to me. And also stock-based compensation is an expense, so I don't understand exactly why they are adding it to operating income. It just does not make much sense to me. But I would just ignore this number and roll with the operating income. And the fact that they're trying to sort of emphasize this adjusted operating income shows that they can be a little disingenuous with this. So once again, they're trying to sell the company in positive terms. Look at the difference here between adjusted operating income and the true operating income, right? So if I were you, I would look at operating income as is because the other stuff is simply management trying to sell a narrative and it's up to you on whether or not you buy it. I simply must say, I don't really buy it. But let's look at the revenue. Now, the revenue is broken down throughout the world, the Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific and other. They have a very healthy chunk of revenue, over $3 billion, and most of that comes through Tinder. It seems to be their biggest app that is still growing, albeit less nowadays. And they also have Hinge, which is their giant growth app. It has grown from 2020 to 2021, 118%. And now from 2021 to 2022, 44%. Now, due to the global situation in 2020, obviously, they were going to grow a lot more from 2020 to 2021 than to 2021 to 2022, simply because it was less possible to meet people in person in 2020. So, of course, that growth was going to be palpable in 2020 and 2021, and maybe it was going to peter off a little bit in 2022. It'll be important to see in these coming years and quarters how these apps grow over time, if they can keep that momentum going, because I think that'll make the big difference. And also, how much Asia Pacific and other regions will be growing relative to the Americas and Europe, because clearly they do represent an untapped market that is also looking for these things. Everyone is looking for a partner, everyone is looking to date, so it's not like there's going to never be any more clients. Of course, they're always going to have clients, but it'll be interesting to see how these different segments grow over time. Now, this is their statement of operations, essentially breaking down their revenue all the way down to their operating income, which we already talked about, 
all the way down to their net income. And as you see, while the operating income has been a little spotty from 2020 to 2022, in fact, it saw this huge decrease, everything else seems to be more or less in order. Their marketing expenses have been mostly flat. If anything, they've gone down a little bit. Their selling general and administrative expenses have gone up a little bit, and that is simply because they're paying higher wages to developers and to other employees. Their product development expense has also been increasing. I assume this has to also do with creating new apps. And their net earnings has been increasing, which is wonderful. Actually, you want to see a bottom line that is healthy. However, if the operating income cannot rebound to previous levels, this bottom line may see some significant loss, especially because they do get some benefits from taxes here and there. They may get some one-time payments that benefit them. So you still want that base of the operating income looking good. Now, we can see also that they have some rising costs. I find it very interesting that in their annual report, they talk about the cost of revenue, which has been increasing every year. As a percentage of revenue, they spent 27% of revenue as the cost of revenue in 2020, then 28% in 2021, and now 30% in 2022. This is less money that goes into their net income. Now, this they're talking about is that app purchase fees went up, essentially. In the Google Play Store, they're also charging you more for purchasing stuff in apps. Not you, the consumer, but maybe the app. So that is something interesting. And... Uh, this there's also an acquisition that affects this uh, this cost of revenue, but you see here that there's a little bit of this aspect of control because they're an app because they're putting stuff on other platforms and also hosting costs can also go up for their websites the things that are not apps. Well, you see that there's a little aspect that they don't have control over, and this is also important to note if these costs are going to rise in general then they're going to suffer for it, and there's not all that much they can do about it, honestly. Now, I want to look at the statement of cash flows. Really, all I'm doing here is looking at this number, which is the cash from operations, and then subtracting the capital expenditures, and this is how you get free cash flow to equity, at least a simplified form, which does not include the net debt. However, this also is something that I want to put some emphasis into. And I want you to look at the stock-based compensation, especially because these tech companies usually have very high stock-based compensation. And this is an expense. So the fact that it's included in net cash provided by operating activities attributable to continuing operations, essentially cash from operations, is a little preposterous. If you're doing a calculation, you should probably remove stock-based compensation, which is an expense, from cash from operations. And you'll see, for example, in this last year, their stock-based compensation was huge. It was $203 million as opposed to $525.6 million in cash from operations. It's a huge portion. It is almost 50% of the cash from operations with stock-based compensation. So removing this is going to show you that their actual cash, the cash money that they're working with is maybe much lower than you realize. Now, this is important, and this is especially important to know with tech companies. So this is something that you have to keep an eye on as well in future years. If the stock-based compensation increases, well, that is something that you'll have to continually keep removing manually for any calculations that use cash flow or free cash flow especially. Now, with this said, I can do a discounted cash flow model using free cash flow to equity. Now, the average sort of um, amount of revenue that gets turned to free cash flow is around 35%. But lately, that number has gone down. Now, I do want to note that their cash from operations in 2022 is much lower than that of 2020 and 2021 because of this huge payment here that they made. Essentially, it had to do with a litigation related to Tinder. This is a one-time thing. You will not see it in the future. So I do feel comfortable making the free cash flow in 2023, similar to that of 2021, because this is a one-time thing. However, the free cash flow margin has been compressing. Back in the day in 2018, 2019, the free cash flow margin was almost 40% of revenue. Now, 
it's more along the lines of 35 to 30% of revenue. So, and even sometimes 25% of revenue. So I'm going to be a little mean to Tinder, at least in 2023 and 2024. And I'm going to say that they turn basically 25% of revenue to free cash flow. And I'm taking some revenue predictions from Yahoo Finance. Essentially, they say that revenue is going to grow 2% in 2023 and then 12% in 2024. And then I'm going to grow revenue by 5% in 2025 and 2026. And I'm also going to say that their cash flow margins improve and they're converting 30% of free cash flow this time into or 30% of revenue into free cash flow. And based on that, I get these numbers. I'm giving it a required rate of return of 11%, which is technically 1% per year more than the market return of 10%, which over time compounds to be a lot, a perpetual growth rate of 2%, they're growing 2% in perpetuity. And with that, I get a fair value of equity of $43.99. However, if we adjust for the net debt that the match group has, I get a fair value of $31.90 with debt included. Now match group, is not near that fair value. Match Group right now is trading at $42.42, which is a little bit far from there. And you see that if you have owned this stock for the last five years, you're probably not happy at all. And they probably weren't anywhere near fair value for any of these five years based on the cash flows and based on the historical numbers. So there is consequences to buying when the stock is overvalued. And if the stock drops even more, maybe it's worth considering. But under these conditions, well, I see two stories. One of them is a story of growing pains. Increasing costs and competition may make Match Group a very difficult sell in this environment. Of course, they are still kings in this sort of online dating market. They still have apps that are going to keep being popular. They'll always have clients. And as long as they can keep making popular apps, they'll be in a good position. But that doesn't mean that other people cannot make dating apps. That doesn't mean that they won't have competition. So they do have a moat, but it's not insurmountable. And this, these increasing costs like hosting, like app fees, um, these things can really shave their margins little by little. Valuation is hinging solely on growth expectations. If match cannot meet those, further pain can be expected. And share buybacks are nice. Recently, they've started buying back shares, but the high debt and compressing profit margins are even more damaging than the buybacks are helpful. So based on this, Match Group would be overvalued. The other thing we could see is a full turnaround, where all these setbacks, such as compressing margins, end up being temporary. Growth rate estimations are beat, essentially, instead of growing 5% per year, for example, they grow 10% per year, and margins either stop compressing or expand to prior levels. A dominant position and growth within current and new apps can keep Match a market leader and can keep competitors from really making those dents within the revenues of Match, and based on this, Match Group would be pretty much fairly valued if this is the case. So, with these two stories now exposed, I must say, it's important to watch the margins. It's cool if a company's revenues are growing a lot, but if the gross profit margins, if the operating margins, if the net profit margins, and if the free cash flow margins are all declining, that is something to worry about. So it's important to watch the margins because both the top line and the bottom line, and even the stuff in between is very important. You have to read between the lines, and when stuff like this happens, you have to ask why, and how likely it'll be that it turns around. Now, I hope that this analysis was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. If you have any questions or any stock that you would like me to cover, please comment down below. I'll be happy to take a look at it. And with that said, if you want to see more content like this, don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and hit the bell button so you get notifications every time I post. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.